Hello, I'm Rachel. And I'm Wyatt, and we'd love to welcome you to Calvary Church Online. If you're joining us for the first time today, we're so glad that you're here. Click the welcome tab, let us know who you are. We'd like to send you a welcome email and a small gift to thank you for joining us here today. And Calvary, we just want to thank you for your continued generosity. It is because of you that we can partner with great ministries and do great work. If you'd like to partner with us today, just follow the information below. All right, Calvary, let's worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to church. We're so glad that you're here. Let's turn our eyes to him. Let's prepare ourselves to worship. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. Shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. And my God still rolling stones away. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be 
now I'm not with your blood you bought my freedom
so glad you're able to join us this Sunday. Uh, myself or my team is online and we would love the chance to pray for you. So uh, if you would love or need that or it will be helpful to your life, go ahead and hit that live prayer button and someone on my team will make sure to connect with you. Now let's give some hearts in the chat and throw some love to Pastor Steve. Calvary Church and welcome back to episode two of our brand new series called We Believe. Now what we believe as a church it ultimately leads to our values, our choices and the actions that we take not only as individuals but as a church body. So this series is it's intended to root and ground us as a faith community and in order to pass on our faith to the next generation in order to effectively reach the world around us. Sometimes we need to go back to the foundational truths that, that started this church, that have brought strength to it over the years, and that this church has the foundation it's been built on. Now, 
Scripturally, we need to understand how these core doctrines influence our church today and how they, more importantly, influence each of our lives, how we do church, how we do life. C.S. Lewis once said this, he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Gordon A. Edie said this, he says, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. I love that. Kanye West recently said this, he said, I'm the God of me. You can't tell me who I am. I can't tell you. I could tell you. It's your job to listen. I'm the God of me. I don't know if I'm in heaven already. <laughs> well, sorry, yay, you're not quite there yet. Chris Pratt on the MTV Movie Awards, speaking to a predominantly very young crowd said, God is real. God loves you. God wants the best for you. Believe me. Believe that, because I do. Jennifer Aniston once said this. She said, I don't have a religion. I believe in a God. I don't know what it looks like, but it's, it's my God. <laughs> my own interpretation of the supernatural. Now, People from all walks of life, from celebrity to scholars, believe all kinds of different things. But the fact that they believe it, no matter how powerful of a voice they have, doesn't make it true. I may believe I'm a toaster, but it's not likely that tomorrow morning I'm going to pop toast out of my face. It's not going to happen. That would be great. It would be very convenient. Just need a little butter close by and this, the day is started quite easily. But it's not going to happen. Just because I say it's true or I believe it to be true, doesn't make it true. Now, some could call our beliefs into question too. They could say, well, just because you believe there's a God doesn't make it true. Well, that depends on who and where you base your beliefs. My knowledge of who he is in my life and the plan he has for me is all based in this book. Again, somebody could say, well, what makes the Bible true? Well, that's where exercising the faith that I've been given and articulating what my faith is based on, that's where that comes into play. That's why we need to know deeply what it is we believe, not just as a church, but as individuals. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be prepared. In other words, read the Bible, study, pray, ask questions. Be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. So if someone asks you, why are you so positive? Why are you so optimistic or full of hope in the face of crazy times? Well, you need to be prepared to answer them. But when you answer, you need to do it with gentleness as the Bible says in 1 Peter, and respect. So not only is there a message that we need to speak very clearly so that people understand, but there's a way that we need to communicate that message too. There's a way to say it. Now, a great follow-up to this series is our four-week Next Steps class, where we dig deeper into how our beliefs affect our growth and how we can better understand the purpose to which God has called us. So I would encourage any of you who are serious about taking those next steps in your life in the development with your walk with God and the discovery of, of how serving God and serving other people actually strengthens your faith as a disciple, I would encourage you today to sign up for that class. The next one will be on May the 5th. So when you go out today, stop by the Welcome Center, tell them, hey, I'd like to go to that uh, class uh, that's being offered. You can come for the 9 o'clock to the class and then stay for the 10.30 service. The course is free, but it's fantastic. It will help give you a sure footing. And we'll also give you an idea of, of the things that, that we truly believe. Now, let me give you three things as we get started that, that you're going to see or find in that class that we have when, then it, when it comes to expressing our, our beliefs effectively. First one is that in our essentials, in our essential beliefs, we have unity, or at least we should. 
These are the kind of foundational truths that, that we're zeroing in on throughout this series. These are the kind of truths that hold us together as a church. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. So we should be unified in our essential beliefs. In our non-essential beliefs, though, we have liberty. And this could range in a variety of areas. Things like worship styles, preferred Bible translations, politics, parenting styles, wine at dinner or wine at all, clothing styles, music, music, movie, television preferences, all these things can divide people and some people are very passionate about how we pray, where we work. Last year, Pastor Susan and I were in Amsterdam at a world conference and we met a young man who uh, is the pastor of a, a next-gen church, a lot of young people. And he's just an incredible young guy and he's got a strong voice for the next generation. And so this next-gen leader uh, gives himself to leading this new church, but he also works at Netflix. And so he said that over time, some people give him a hard time about that. Like, how can you work for a company like Netflix who, who offers such questionable programming? And some people feel very strongly about this, even to the point where some would just say, I, I can't talk to you anymore, which I think is horrible because I think God has called all of us to shine in dark places. Now, what they don't know is that this young man was also instrumental in bringing The Chosen, that series, to Netflix, where now untold thousands will hear the gospel in a new and creative way. But these things that I mentioned, these are the kinds of things that, that people have felt passionate about for many years, and some for, for good reason. But they shouldn't be deal breakers. They shouldn't be relationship enders. There are some who feel very strongly about alcohol, about not drinking it. And so sometimes that can cause tension between other people. But what you may not know is that that individual may have a family member who struggled with addiction. Maybe they, they saw people's lives destroyed because of it. So we need to be sensitive to these things because what may not be an issue for you in moderation may be a, a, a very sensitive issue when it comes to what other people believe. Romans chapter 14 verses 1, 4, 12, and 22 says, except those who are weak in faith without quarreling over disputable matters. All these things I mentioned, and there's a long list of many more, these are disputable manners. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servant stand or fall. So then, each of us will give account of ourselves to God. So whatever you believe about these things, these disputable matters, keep them between yourself and God. Never allow the non-essential beliefs to divide us. We were created in his image. Remember last week we talked about the triune God. He's the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is and defines community. He's made us in his image. He's made us with a need for one another. And as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with one another, he also abides in us. And so we need to express that same kind of consideration in love as we live with one another because we need one another. But in all our beliefs, we should show charity. Now, another translation for that word charity is the word love, which you're familiar with. Remember what we read earlier in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you, sharing your beliefs with gentleness and respect. That's showing love. So when you come in contact, even with another believer in Christ that feels strongly about maybe a non-essential item, don't do something just to flaunt what you have liberty in understand and appreciate that they're coming from a certain position and experience. And maybe it will require a little bit more time for you to listen to their story and lovingly hear where their passion is coming from. And you'll discover, like Jesus did, that 
that you can love people into the kingdom, especially when it comes to people of other faiths. Show them Jesus in your life. Don't show them your anger. Love them. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 2 says, If I hold in my mind not only all human knowledge, but the very secrets of God, and if I have that faith that can move mountains, but have no love, I amount to nothing at all. That summarizes all of it. That no matter how advanced in our understanding, our beliefs, our theology and doctrine, if we lack love, we're missing the example that Jesus left for us. Love them into the, the, to the kingdom of God. Don't try arguing them through the door. All right, let's continue to look deeper at, at our essential beliefs. Last week, as I mentioned earlier, we looked and covered the Trinity and creation. But we also believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. I want to be very clear about that. He became a man. He was crucified on the cross so that humanity could experience forgiveness and freedom. That's the gospel. That's what we're forever thankful for. He was fully God and perfect man. Jesus rose from the dead after he was crucified. He ascended into heaven, and he is returning on the last day. That's the good news. He's coming back, and maybe sooner than you think. John chapter 14, verse 6 Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, those words were some of the most life-altering, controversial words that Jesus ever spoke. The audacity of this man to say what he just said, it stirred up the religious, made them see red. They were so upset. But in this moment... Jesus is, is actually preparing his disciples for his death and his departure. He's rented the upper room in Jerusalem, and he's prepared a meal for them. They're going to have supper together. And as they arrive, he, he washes their feet. He cares for them. He expresses his love. And then he drops a bombshell and tells them that, that he's going back to heaven, that he's leaving. And suddenly they were kind of flabbergasted, stunned in this moment. It would be like falling in love with someone that you, you just met for the first time and then over dinner, them telling you, hey, by the way, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going back to where I live, which is on the other side of the world. We're probably never, never going to see each other again. You can imagine what that felt like for the disciples. So as soon as Jesus, he shares this huge news, the disciples are immediately filled with questions. What if? What, if what's, what do you mean? What? Like they wanted more information. But Jesus knew this. He knew this, and that's why I believe he chose this focused time away from all the crowds to answer their questions and to reassure each of them that everything was going to be all right. He knew they needed answers. And he knew they needed understanding so that they could continue to grow and develop just like each of us. That's really the heart and the intent of this We Believe series that we're in. Jesus knew they needed assurance and that it, they needed to know that it was all part of God's plan to lead other people on that same journey, the one that they were on themselves. Jesus Christ, the great I am, is at the very core of everything that, that, that we believe here at Calvary at the center of our ministry to kids, to students, to families, in our worship, in our small groups, in our outreach locally and around the world. At the center of it all is Jesus. When he's at the center of our lives, when he's at the center of our friendships, our marriages, and our church, then we're able to maintain our focus because it's really all about integrated priorities. You know, one of the great challenge of uh, an ever-growing church is trying to remember everybody's names. Last week we had a new to Calvary lunch and it was so wonderful to meet so many of you for the first time, but it's challenging sometimes to kind of recall when it's right on the tip of your tongue and you see someone and you're trying to remember uh, these names, trying to put that name to this face. You know, the name of Jesus is hard to forget. In Philippians 2, Paul uses a, a hymn to explain that 
God has made Jesus, who made himself nothing, who humbled himself and became obedient, even to the death of the cross, to be the center of it all. Again, it's the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. He has exalted Jesus to the, to the highest place, to a place where the world will never, ever, ever forget his name. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul explains that, that it is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under earth. Now notice every knee. There's no exceptions. Every knee will bow. Those who think they're the most powerful and influential, every knee will bow. But note also the scope in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The name of Jesus is a name never, ever, ever to be forgotten. Now, John, the writer of the Gospel of John, the friend of Jesus, the one who Jesus asked to take care of his mother, this John actually saw the risen, resurrected Jesus in a vision in the book of Revelation. And this is what happened. This was his response. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 18 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. I think it's interesting that, that even though John knew Jesus better than most, Scripture says that he fell to his feet as if he were dead. The risen Christ is uh, an exalted and awesome sight, as you can imagine, which is a diff different picture, a very different picture than that smiling bobblehead Jesus on the dash of somebody's car. Uh, it's a different sight. He's not just your buddy. He, he's the Lord. He's the center of everything. But even in his majesty, even in his great power, look at the words of comfort that he offers. Don't be afraid. And then he says, I am the first and the last. Jesus is the eternal Lord of all. That's the power. John wrote this in the opening verse of his gospel. He said, in the beginning was the word. So we see Jesus as the first, at the very beginning of it all. Then in Matthew 25, 32, we have another picture of Jesus, a very powerful one on his throne with all the nations gathered before him. So here we see the coming of uh, this moment when Jesus will also judge. So we see him as the last, the first and the last, at the beginning of creation and at the last judgment. First and last, Alpha and Omega, as it says in Revelation twenty two thirteen, 13, which are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is the name by which every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. We believe he is the first and the last. He's the first and last of our lives. He's the first and last of every day that we live. God has declared Jesus as our center. And as a church, listen, we are determined to keep him there in everything that we do. Now, how can we embrace this core belief in our lives today? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can make him center. We need to be deliberate about that. Not long after Jesus' death, we hear Peter shouting this from the streets of Jerusalem. You know, not only is he alive, but then he says in Acts 4.12, he says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We didn't earn it. It's through his amazing grace. So we believe we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that salvation is for all people without exception. Then we need to make a decision, each of us, to follow him or not. You've been given a free will. And by being a follower of Jesus, it's more than just being a, a casual follower by clicking or unclicking a follow button. Following Jesus should change you. It will change you. It means turning from going your way and now going his. In the book of Matthew, verse 16, 
uh, chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. See, it's about denying our own agenda and yielding ourselves to his. And following his example by laying down our life for those around us. Then after we follow him, we need to learn to live in confidence. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 tells us that, says, well then, shall we, or what shall we say in response to these things? So when people say to you, uh, you're crazy to believe in the Bible. You're crazy to believe what you think Christ has done for you. Scripture tells us here to know that if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, we know the answer to that. The simple answer is no one. But we need to know that deep in our hearts, that no matter what kind of opposition we face, that we need to continue to stand in what we believe. Because he's the one, after all, in Revelation 1, that even in the midst of those times, because some of those times can rock you, shake you to your core. But he says, don't be afraid. Our confidence is not rooted in our own ability, our own willpower. Our confidence is secure in the finished work that Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And then finally, we need to let the world know. You know, we've been blessed here at Calvary throughout the years in the history of our church to see literally thousands of people, young and old, make decisions to follow Christ, many of whom have also uh, been baptized. We believe that water baptism is a, an outward statement of an inward decision to follow Jesus, and it was modeled and established by Jesus himself, all the way under the water and all the way up again, dying to our old self and coming up in newness of life, a new chapter that, that all of us can walk in. Last week, we celebrated eight people who made commitments to follow Christ and, and were baptized. It was a great celebration. We were so excited in both our main campus and in our Mandarin campus. But what happens when people see people taking steps, other people want to, to, to take those same steps too. So we've added another baptism coming up. And I would encourage you, if you're, if you're considering water baptism, then I would encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center or if you're watching online to let one of the hosts know in the chat and we'll get you the information that you need so that you can join us uh, at our next baptism on May the 19th. And then on May 5th, again, is our next steps class where we cover what baptism means. It's important to understand that, that you need to know why you're doing it, especially when it comes to if, if we believe in water baptism or well, why. Well, again, we, it's, a, it's a symbolic thing. It's, a, it's a, a statement. It's that outward statement. It's a, making it public. It's making your faith public to the world about the decision that you've made in your heart. And so I encourage you, if you've never been water baptized, if you're thinking and praying about it, if you're watching online, come out to the church on May the 19th. Come out on the 5th of May and come to our Next Steps class so that you can learn about, about being baptized. And then we're going to just have a party. We're going to celebrate with all of those that are going to be baptized. And in that class, again, you're going to learn more about the vision of the church. You're going to understand more about what it is that we believe. But baptism is it's significant. It's making public that, that moment. Someone has once said that baptism is like the, the, the wedding band on your, your hand that, that shows that you're married. Baptism is like the wedding band of our faith to the world to say, this is what we've done. Acts 10, 47 to 48 says, Surely no one can stand in the way of being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So after you make public the commitment that you've made to Christ, then he calls us and sends us into the world to take that that news of what he's done, to be a testimony of his power, to tell people what Christ has done within you, and then to take that good news, to take the gospel to a world that doesn't know that truth. Share the good news so that others can be changed and transformed. That's the power of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his obedience even to the cross to lay down his life, to give it all for the forgiveness of our sins. 
to not only die to, to those sins, but to be raised to life. We're thankful that you abide within us today, that our lives are changed forevermore. We're thankful through, through moments like water baptism, we can proclaim to the world what has happened on the inside, the decision that we've made. We can, we can let everyone know and we can uh, share it with the world. I pray today that we would, we would truly value our salvation and understand that it is for all men and women. And today, no matter where you are, whether you're here in the house, whether you're watching from home or in a hotel on the other side of the world, wherever you are, maybe you're w w going through the park with your headphones on, uh, getting some exercise. Today is an opportunity for you to give your life to Christ. I would be remiss after talking about Jesus and salvation and even water baptism to not give you an opportunity to recognize that what he did on Calvary's cross, he did for you. He laid his life down so that you could pick yours up and live it for the forgiveness of your sin. If that's you today and you say, Pastor Steve, I, I need to pray. I need to know that, that he's my Lord and Savior. Or maybe you're, you're thinking, I need to rededicate my life because I, I recognize that the days are short. The days we're living in, I, I need Christ like never before. If that's you in either one of those positions, pray this simple prayer with me. Father God, I ask today that, that you forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Help me to proclaim your truth forevermore. I thank you that you've given me hope because of what you've done, that you've given me a new life, a new beginning, that I am made new. Lord, come into everything that I am. Be the first and last of every situation, every relationship, every decision, in all that I do. In Jesus name and now Lord I pray for those that have prayed that prayer but maybe have been a little lost and have strayed if you've prayed that prayer today too today is is a new beginning for you uh, and so I bless you today in Jesus name believing that God would work in and through your life in a powerful way in Jesus name we pray amen if you're here in the house today and you've prayed that prayer, go ahead and take one of those yellow cards in the back of the seat, fill it out, uh, put your name and your email on it, take it out to the Welcome Center. We've got a, uh, a gift for you and some resources that we can help you in your walk with God. If you've made that commitment and you're watching online, uh, tell one of the hosts today. Uh, give them the same information and we would love to send you some free uh, information and, and tell you about how you can connect and grow. And can I say this? If you've prayed that prayer today, consider being water baptized uh, on May the 19th with everyone who will be joining us on that day. Join us for the, the 5th of May as well for the Next Steps class. It will help you to grow, to know exactly what it is that you believe. God's best, Calvary. Have an amazing week. Calvary is a final act of worship. We want to give you the opportunity to worship with your tithes and offerings. This is a time when we can honor God with the things that he has blessed us with. And it is because of your generosity that we can partner with different organizations such as Night Shift and City Dream Center and missionaries all around the world to further God's glory. If you'd like to partner with us, just follow the information below. Let me pray to bless our offering. Dear God, uh, thank you for this opportunity that we can come and worship you. I pray that as we, as we tithe and offer um, towards your glory, God, and to honor you, that we will see the work that you do in our church in our city, um, in our country, God, that we'll see your hand over everything that our ministry covers. Lord, in your name, amen. All right, Calvary, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week.